Good morning, and welcome to, to Moments with Melinda. Thank you for joining me this morning. My guest is Linda Tarwell. And Linda, how are you? I'm great. And so delighted to be on with you, Melinda. I am thrilled. Listen, I've been researching you for the last three days, and I have to tell you, you have an incredible bio. And so uh, we have a lot to talk about in 30, 30 minutes. So I think we should probably get going, right? Sounds good. All right. So to my viewers, let me introduce you to Linda Tarwalen. Linda has been a nurse, management consultant, advocate, nonprofit leader, communicator, union negotiator, and government official at state, national, and international levels. She served as ambassador to the UN Commission on the Status of Women in the Clinton administration and as deputy assistant for women's concerns in the Carter White House. She is also an award-winning author, and she is the recipient of numerous awards for her work and exemplary life. Would you say that that's all pretty much correct? Oh, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that is correct. And also, you're a dear friend. We've known each other for a long time, ever to, ever since you moved back to Vermont. So I really honor our friendship. Um, so uh, I want to start at the beginning. I want to learn a little bit about your life growing up, Linda. Uh, could you share that with us, please? Oh, sure. Um, I had a great childhood, but it was in two different chunks, basically. Uh, until I was eight years old, um, my family lived in Springfield, Massachusetts, where my dad was a, a editor of the local newspaper. And his father had been an editor of a different local newspaper. So we were journalistic family. Uh, and then my father led a strike on the local newspaper because there was no heat in the city room for the reporters. Springfield, Massachusetts is pretty doggone cold in the winter. And uh, so, and they lost the strike after 18 months. I think it's still one of the longest strikes the Newspaper Guild ever had. And when the strike was over, I remember the strike. I remember going with my dad down to where the picket lines were. He took me everywhere on his shoulders. Um, my brother is five years younger than I am, so I was of an age where I could do those things. And uh, so when, when the strike was over, he was blacklisted. Uh, he could not get a job in a newspaper in, in Massachusetts. Uh, they all kind of like had a cabal about who they would hire and who they wouldn't hire. So we moved out to Columbus, Ohio. So the first part of my life was all with lots of family. Both of my parents came from large families, lots of cousins, lots of picnics, all of that. Then in Ohio, my dad was an official of the CIO, which was a very progressive national a labor organization later to merge with what we now know as the AFL-CIO. And he did the communications there and he wrote the speeches for the president of the UAW, who was uh, Walter Ruther, who became the president of the CIO. So I've been kind of like in politics for a very, very, very long time. Um, but Ohio was very different. Um, uh, our kids like the story of my first lunch at school in the second grade, my mother made a typical New England sandwich for me. And it was a cucumber sandwich. And the laughter was unbelievable because nobody in Ohio would think of having a cucumber sandwich. So, I mean, I had to learn a different way of doing business out there. And my dad was on the road all the time. So it was my mom and the two of us, my brother and myself. And it was really very very different. We didn't know anybody. We weren't related to anybody, but we met lots of wonderful people. We moved to the D.C. when I was uh, 12 and my dad became a national labor official. Uh, and we lived in D.C. and that's where I went to high school. And ultimately, that felt like home, D.C. area. I lived in the D.C. area for 50 years off and on. So I went to uh, just a quick update as I went to college at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore doing nursing. Uh, and then life took on its own pattern after that. So I wanted to ask you about that. How did your career in nursing take you to the world of union lobbyist, CEO of the Center for Policy Alternatives, and creating a successful international management consultancy working with leaders of foundations, nonprofits, and international organizations. How did nursing take you there? And I know there's a great story about your nursing career, your first job. 
<laughs> the first day of my first job, yeah, actually. Yeah, that's a great uh, story. Yeah, I, I was at that point, I was married before to, to a, another man. And my first day on the job was in Champlain, Illinois. Champaign, not Champlain. Sorry, I'm now local here, uh, Illinois. And the director of nursing came up at, at 10 o'clock in the morning and she said, came to where I was running the floor and she said, you have to come down right away to my office. And so I had no idea what was going on. I went down, she had me stand in front of her like you know a soldier who was being chastised. And she said, the first thing she said was, do you want to quit or be fired? And I said, well, what is? what are we talking about? Well, I had been sitting at the bedside of a patient fixing an IV, but what she wanted to, to uh, let me go about was I hadn't stood up for a doctor when he came in the room. And that was the old days. That were really, you know, doctors were the kings and <laughs> nurses were not princesses, that's for sure. Um, so at any rate, I told her she'd have to fire me. I was, I'm not going to quit over something like that. And, you know, my dad had just written the last check for my tuition in nursing college. And uh, so I called and told him I, I was really nervous about calling. He said, good for you. You'll get another job. You know, so well, good for you. Good for you for not standing up for the doctor who walked in the room. <laughs> well, at least not, not being fired because of it. Well, yeah, well, being fired, I think now. So, But that was the beginning in many ways of your rebellious nature to help pave the way for women. So, you know, Ladies Home Journal named you one of the 50 most powerful women in Washington. And this was back in the 1990s. Would you consider yourself a woman who helped to break the glass ceiling for other women? And I would say without a doubt, absolutely yes. But talk a little bit about that, about, about how you, because I'm sure you had an impression on that nurse when you said, well, fire me. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about how hard it was for you to just break through that glass ceiling. Well, I haven't been a very ambitious person, despite the, the uh, bio that I have, because in almost all of the cases, I was doing volunteer work in addition to what I was being paid for and having a family uh, that came to people's attention. And so I was off, you know, I was offered job jobs that I did not expect. And then I went in and that became part of my mantra, which was my mother's advice. If somebody opens the door, they see something in you that you, you might not even see in yourself. So go do it, do the best you can. And, you know, and that's the way my life has been. So in nursing, I got more and more annoyed at what was happening in terms of nurses were not paid well. Doctors were paid very well. Doctors had Wednesday afternoon off to play golf. Nurses, I worked six days a week in those days um, for $200 a month. So I got, I got kind of annoyed about all of that. And I decided to go back to school so I could teach nursing and see if I could sort of encourage a little rebellion on the side. So I did, I got a, a bachelor's and then a master's degree and I taught nursing for quite a few years, uh, a hospital school of nursing in DC and then the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And then my rebellion caught me again and uh, I started working. This is when Medicare first passed. I know that sounds like ancient history, but this was in the mid 60s and nursing homes did not have enough registered nurses to only have RNs at night taking care of patients. And so I started training. Uh, I started with my my master's students doing work with. Um, I started with my master's students to prepare a curriculum for preparing licensed practical nurses to be in charge at night in nursing homes. And the nursing profession, my dean and I got called up to New York. We got another dressing down. I think maybe that's what made me so rebellious. It's all these dressing downs that I had. So at any rate, um, so I left Maryland to work with a union. Uh, I brought a case for, for academic freedom. And in the meantime, I got offered a job with a union and it felt like coming home. Outstanding. So now Hardwick College, just this May, honored you with an honorary degree for this, and it was a well-deserved honor. And I want to congratulate you on that, Linda. Thank you. So let's dig into your move to Vermont. 
um, share with us what inspired you to come up to this beautiful Green Mountain State. Oh, God, we love it. We've been here 13 years. And the first woman that I met, I had a friend in South Carolina who knew Melinda. Her office had been next door to Melinda's office. And she said, I don't know about all the women. She said, you'll love the women, but here's the first person you need to meet. So I called you up and said, you know, would you have time for a cup of coffee? I'm the newbie in town. And our friendship has gone from there. But but that just tells you uh, that's the way I normally do things. So we came up here. Uh, we My husband is British and Irish and American. So we uh, we first uh, we worked in London, New York and Washington, big cities, both both of us. When we decided to retire, we thought we'll go down to South Carolina, very close to Washington, relatively, and have a house on the beach, right? Well, we did. We built this beautiful house. What we didn't take in, in mind were our politics were so different from the people there. We didn't fit in. They didn't fit, feel like we fit in. Uh, we volunteered a lot, all those things, but it just didn't feel like home. Also, because he's British, I mean, old Keith it didn't have a good time with the hot weather and the humidity and the bugs. So we started to come up to Vermont in the summers, first in Chester, Vermont, which is down in the southern part of the state, or was, I guess central, really. And we loved it. And after a while, we said, we're never going back. We you know, bought a house in Burlington, and, and the rest is the story. Well, we are all better for you being here, Linda. You well, know, thanks. And, and you have brought so much in this short time that you've lived here. Thank you for your service to our state. So, so what has life in Vermont been for you and Keith? And how have you managed? How have you managed to maintain the level of incredible accomplishment, commitment, and excitement that you had throughout your life up here in Vermont? Well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, you know, I'm 84 now, so it gets a little trickier. Your body does some tricks on you, and there's only so many things you can do compared to what you might want to do. But the first thing that I did when we came up here was uh, we had had a consulting firm, as you mentioned in the introduction. And I realized that we were way too expensive for local act activities. So I volunteered my time as a, a consultant, uh, you know, pro bono consultant was what I called myself. And I, I worked with a lot of nonprofit organizations here, which was a wonderful way to not only get engaged, but to meet a lot of people. And I began to serve on a number of boards. I mean, it, this is a place that welcomes someone from another state. Um, New England doesn't necessarily have that reputation of being so warm and welcoming, uh, but it has been easy to be involved. And my husband is also really involved. I'll tell you the other thing is we live in a wonderful neighborhood. We live in the new north end of, of Burlington. And uh, our kids and grandkids just think it's the best. Our, our youngest grandson said, man, it's just like a country club. You've got pools and the beach and the tennis courts. What else could we want? So our family has all been excited. We did not move up for our family. Our kids are in Florida and Colorado. We didn't really want to live in either of those two places. And uh, so we see a lot of them, but not as much as if, if they live down the street. Well, we're delighted to have you in Vermont. I think Vermont's a better place for having you and Keith here. Now, talk a little bit to us about the past few years and how so much of what we work so hard for to elevate women has been torn down and what we can do to fight against any further attacks on the freedoms and rights of women. Well, you're right. It has been very disheartening, worse than discouraging, really disheartening to watch a lot of things. The Supreme Court decision on, uh, you know, abortion rights. I was one, to the, one of the founders of Voters for Choice years and years and years ago. So, you know, that was just one of the issues. Uh, but to see it was also balanced, however, by seeing women move up. And, and my thing has always been, uh, you know, not just for myself, but as Kamala Harris said in one of her speeches, is to open the door for other people. So that has been a big part of what I have done, mentoring and all, all kinds of programs to, to do that. So it's been hard. If you had interviewed me last week, 
this is the week where President Biden stepped down and Kamala Harris clearly has cinched the nomination. If you had asked me last week how I felt, it would have been very uh, negative. I am so jazzed and looking so positively at a different world, a one that is not full of hate, but full of love. And so uh, you caught me at a really good time. And I I hope everyone who is watching, whether your politics are this or not, that you get engaged and we find a way to bring our divided country together. Well, well, I think we need to make America laugh again. So, aha, this is your book. Um, I want to move into talking about your book, Women Lead the Way. It received a 4.6 rating on Amazon. It can be purchased there or preferably at a local bookstore. But it won the gold medal for women's books from Forward Magazine. Talk to us about your book, Linda, and why you wrote it. Well, my book really started, uh, I, I didn't retire until I was 72. And the book was a project that I started just before I retired. Um, I really had some fabulous experiences. I was a public delegate for the United States to the big Beijing conference on women, 50,000 women and men who were part of the conference in Beijing, China. And what I, I it really changed my life, Melinda, because what I heard were the presidents and prime ministers, virtually all men, of course, get up and talk about the fact that unless women moved ahead, their countries could not succeed. It wasn't about, oh, poor women, they need help. Well, the women do need help, but we were missing the other part of the discussion, which is what is the society missing when we are not part of the decision making? So that was one really big push for me. The second was that I had met women all over the country. I had traveled and spoken and all the rest. So I'd met women all over the country and I found common themes. So I did focus groups with Celinda Lake, who's now become famous. She wasn't famous in those days and she she deserves to be famous. Focus groups all across the country to find out what younger women were thinking. What were women on welfare thinking? What are women in the rural areas thinking? And what I found was number one issue was women didn't have the confidence to move themselves forward. And so I decided that I knew enough, I had seen enough that I was going to try and write a book that would be not just for women. The first third of the book is all about where we are in the world, how poorly off we are when we think we're just the best country for women's equality. Um, and, And some statistics for people to ground themselves. And then the second third of the book really is all about uh, how you get there. Uh, It was a guide to stepping up to leadership. And that was the second half, second third. And the last third was changing the world. What would the world look like if in fact we had a critical mass of women and when the research says is 30% on every board, every commission, every church board, every PTA, if you have 30% or more women, you get, different outcomes. If you're in business, you get profits. If you are in other kinds of fields, the the family and work thing changes, which God knows we need. So um, the book, I wrote the book. I was a distinguished fellow at a think tank in New York while I wrote it and traveled the country. And then when when it came out, Keith and I went to 30 states, three countries, It really was an amazing experience to go out and around the country. And I still get letters from people. Um, I just heard from a woman who wrote me a note and she said, I'm now chairing the board at her organization. She said, I told you when we had dinner, I would never, ever do that. But I read your book and I said, well, why not? I'm as good as any of those boys. So I always love those. (laughs) I have shared many copies of your book with with women, um, friends of mine. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if you ever read Paul Hawkins' book on the hundred things that the world could do to save the planet. No. Um, it's an extraordinary, it's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous book. And they go through a hundred different things that we all can do. And guess what? I think it's close to the number one item is. Guess I mean, you don't need to guess what it is. We don't have time for guessing games. But the number one thing was educate girls. Oh, that's right. 
That's right. Well, that was the number one thing coming out of that Beijing conference, um, because in many countries, uh, I still remember the the, uh, the math on Pakistan, less than 15 percent of girls went to school beyond the age of 10 in Pakistan at the time of the Beijing conference in 1995. And so now it's up about 40 percent, 50 percent. And they have Bangladesh uh, next door has a woman prime minister who is serving her third term. You know, here it's controversial about a woman as president or prime minister in other countries, but we're just uh, out of step with the rest of the world. So if you want to do it, you educate girls and have women make decisions. Why is it that one of our political parties is so ramped up about putting women and women's rights back in the bottle and going back 50 years? I mean, what is the motivation for that? Well, my personal opinion is it's all about power. Uh, I just read one of the commentators uh, who are supporting J.D. Vance, uh, the new nominee, <laughs> terrible nominee for vice president. And, and what he was saying is, women, we only like traditional marriage with women at home, dad working, and then the, the children at home who are your natural children. Well, my children, our children, are, are adopted children. I can't have any children after long illnesses and so forth. So that would just say, well, that's they're not really your children. You don't really committed to the future of the country if you don't have children. So their background, I really feel like, is basically women in the kitchen or, or on their mom. backs. How about on their backs? You know. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's still the same. It's well, still yeah, the same. I, but for you and I, I mean, I'm only 10 years younger than you. You and I are pretty much from a similar generation. I mean, all the hard work that we did to find out that in a blink, in a blink of an eye within four years, our right, reproductive rights have been taken away, a racial justice, racial rights. I mean, the the teardown and the fact that the that that um this particular party is coming out so blatantly racist and sexist towards our towards, you know, Kamala Harris. And I think they'll win because of that. And it and it's um it's really shocking because because those some of the a lot of those people are from our men are from our generation. And um but anyway, I'm going to move on to this because you and I could go on and on and on. Yes, we could. And we'll do that at our next dinner party. But we will. <laughs> women, I believe now that today that women hold more power today than ever before in our country. I believe they do. And with VP Harris stepping into the ring to be our first woman of color president, uh, where do you see our future uh, over the next five to 10 years? Well, first of all, I do think that this is a real watershed election. Um, the president was on television last night talking about why he had stepped down for new voices and, and uh, younger people. And I really think we've got to get this right, because if, in fact, we don't, if, in fact, Trump were to win this election, I think we're headed down an even worse road of, of autocracy and the end of democracy and really terrible things. But I am so heartened by an excellent woman, an excellent candidate, a person with an incredible background. And when she said she knows, you know, what in her thing as a prosecutor, she knows people like Donald Trump. I thought he doesn't know what's coming. But each one of us, this is, in fact, a time when the country is such. I just talked to our daughter and her wife down in Florida. They're trying to decide whether to put all of their time <coughs> in the Kamala race or the ballot issues that's on to reestablish a right to abortion in Florida. We've each got to find our place and and spend our time. It's not a long time, it's 100 days or so, uh, but I really feel like our future and our grandchildren's future, uh, we have four grandkids and what will happen with their lives is actually going to be determined by what happens with this election. Well, we're gonna move right into that. So what would be your words of wisdom for our youth today as they grow up in a climate that is the hottest ever known in history, democracy on the brink, and a world moving more toward author authoritarian regimes. What would be your words of wisdom for these youth today to your grandchildren? Well, yeah, I, I, our grandchildren are 27, 
25, 18, and 16. So we cover a lot of territory. And we do talk about this sort of thing. So I would say, talk about it with the kids, first of all. But the young people, I think, are more energized than certainly my generation was at the same age. And, and I've, I've been working on a second book on activism, which is the theme. If you're going to, you know, they talk about a through line when you write a book. Well, I think the through line is activism. And that's what I believe is that if we get active, if all of us do our share, my mother used to say, we all have to do our bit, Linda, uh, then I think that there's a future ahead of us, whether it's the climate or it's freedom, or it's racial justice, or it's women's rights, rights to our own bodies. The only way we can preserve that is to take our time and make it happen in some little way. You know, you can call your friends in another state. You can write postcards. You can register people. You can volunteer for a campaign. You can volunteer to run for office. Uh, any of those steps can make a difference in the end. People can read your book. Well, that's good too. I always yeah. like that. Women Lead the Way by Linda right. Tomwellen. Get it at your local bookstore or on Amazon. Well, I have to tell you, hold it up one more minute, Melinda, because one man that was interviewing me looked at it and he said, oh, whoa, men lead the way. He saw the, the globe as it was, whoa, men lead the way. God That's sake. not what was about. I spent a lot of time talking to men's organizations and boards of directors and so forth. And um, they didn't get it. They, well, I think they're getting oh, it now. Well, now they're getting it. They must be because we're slamming yeah. them over the head with it. And now this, this is available at local bookstores, right? Is it at Phoenix? Yes, it is. Perfect. So and always Barnes go to your local and Amazon. So always go to your local bookstores first, folks. Um, so you must be thrilled that Burlington now has its first female and gay mayor. Absolutely. Emma's yes. doing a very good job. She is doing a great job. I am, she I'm, is. And you know, you can feel the energy in the city. I was there the other day and the place is blossoming. I mean, there's so That's much great. energy and, it's, and, and, and there's a lot of people and the storefronts are busy and I just, I just think she's brought so much new energy. So, so now talk to us a bit. Now you talked a little bit about your new book, but do you have other projects that you're working on? And because you are a doer and you're a mover and shaker. Um, so what are your passions today? What are you, what are you focusing in your life right now as you head well, into 84? There's a lot of threads to it, Melinda. They don't necessarily all hang together, I don't think. But like Hartwick College, once I spoke at graduation, They've now invited me to come back as a lecturer and uh, and doing some big dinners and so forth there. So I'm back to doing some teaching. I taught at Champlain as a volunteer for a long time on women's leadership. So now I'm going to do that. I've been writing that up. I write a blog for an organization called Nurses for America, which is nurses to be politically active and what they can do. Um, so those are my two, I would say, bigger projects at the moment. Um, and a lot of it is uh, my husband is very active as well. So we kind of support each other in the projects that we do. Um, and some of those connect up with things that you and Rick are doing, which is just wonderful, basically. Um, what I really want is to get other people to have the skills I have. Mm. You know, you get to a certain stage, you know, you're not going to be able to be here forever or do it forever. So my big thing is working with younger people to give them the skills that I learned on the job, basically, so that they can carry it forward. Oh, that's so noble and beautiful, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, well, you know, we're coming, we're sort of coming to the end of our, of our interview. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with my viewers about the time that we're living in? Because I know that, um, well, there certainly there was a lot of concern a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, um, but we have we have a you know a hard road to to journey upon. And um, you are a woman of great wisdom and vision, and certainly you have so much experience behind you. So for my viewers who are on this, who are watching our show. What words of wisdom would you give them to maintain hope and, and, a, and, and a sense of, of, of confidence about their futures? 
Well, I think hope is the biggest thing that I can say I have this week that I didn't have last week. Because uh, I really do believe that we were in a terrible straits about the potential of being able to defeat Trump and everything he stands for. I would say no matter where you are, no matter what you do, help another woman come forward. Dads can do this. Men can do this as well as women. Move, move women up. And the, the other thing that I would say, I used to really like uh, some of the, the statements like the National Council for Negro Women. I know that's an old term, but they started right after the Civil War. And their sense was lift someone up. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really important thing. And then don't expect somebody else to do the work. We all have to do the work ourselves. And so please be involved, be active, make a difference. Stand up, speak out and make a difference is the whole thing. It's beautiful. Well, you know, you're a grand lady and I am so honored to know you and to have spent the last 10 years of my life under your your beautiful light. Um, you know, you're an incredible woman and and I honor you in a very big way. So thank you for being on my show. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. You know, I feel like I'm now part of the, the woodwork in Burlington, Vermont. If you've been on Melinda's show, if you haven't, you're just nobody. Oh, stop. That's <laughs> not true. So good. Thank you for that. And to my viewers out there, to all of you beautiful people, I wish you a wonderful day, a beautiful week, and I will see you shortly. Goodbye. <laughs>